them in the name of Jesus, that this moment we're in, that we would not miss it, but that we would squeeze it for all it's worth, that we would hold on to your word today. Let us be word movers. Let us be word walkers, word talkers, and word, Lord God, shakers, Lord God. We thank you for what you're going to do. It's in the precious, matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated if you can. We're going to the next level. Have you ever seen someone driving in the wrong direction? I've seen it before. They were on a road and they came out and they should have made a right, but they made a left onto a one-way street. And when they made the left onto the one-way street, because I was coming, it scared me. Y'all whip me up. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, I say scared, you know, just for a moment that the person wasn't cognizant of what they were doing was enough to say, man, if they don't wake up quickly to my horn and me flashing my lights, and if it's not me, then maybe the next person, they will miss the fact that they're driving down the wrong road. Have you ever seen people driving down the wrong road in life? They're going in the wrong direction. And going in the wrong direction means you are headed for a collision. And what God wants us to do is to quickly get on the right road, in the right direction, in the center of his will. Y'all going to say amen? God wants us to discover that as he told the apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, that it is difficult to kick against the pricks, meaning it is hard to go against the will of God. And what God wants us to do is submit quickly and say, God, let me get on the right road. Today, we're talking about going to the next level and turning around, doing a U-turn, if you will, to recognize that some of us may be going in the wrong direction. And the clarion or wake-up call to that is simply an understanding that, you know, it's taken me a lot to go in this direction. Maybe I need to change directions to go to the next level. You know, they call it a paradigm shift in science to recognize that you were going in the, in the wrong direction. It's, it's a way of thinking that God is after to arrest this morning that someone sitting here, you may have the wrong thinking about something. And that's why it is difficult for you to go in the direction where you're going and that you might wake up this morning to the right direction and what God has for you could be the thing to take you over and up to the next level. Look at your neighbor quickly and tell them we're going to the next level. Come on, tell them like they need to know we're going to the next level. See, in the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, here we are in Luke chapter 10. We're reading about the 70 disciples who were on the mission field. Jesus just sends them out in chapter 10, verse number one. And they represent the last effort of Christ to go out into the world and evangelize before he goes on to the cross. It's interesting, though, in Luke chapter 10, verse number one, he sent them out, watch this, two by two. Now, when Jesus sent them out two by two, this is not the first mention of two by two in the Bible. We know that two by two, the animals got on the ark and the, in the days of Noah before the flood came. And this time we see Jesus, the son of God, sending out people, what, two by two. Why two by two? If you're looking to take points, this is the first one. Because we all need each other. Read that with me. Say, we need each other. I'll say it like you really mean it. Say, we need each other. What's significant about two by two is the need for companionship and connection. God has designed us for human touch and connectivity, and without it, we feel incomplete. You know, in the early 1900s, there were several experiments conducted on babies. They took babies who were orphans or babies who were disabled, God forbid, babies who were refugees to see if the absence of human touch would cause them to have some kind of negative impact or could they thrive without human touch. They also thought, well, if we didn't give them language, would they pick up the language of the Greeks and those uh, uh, Latin languages? Could they learn them off by osmosis? These experiments were later considered unethical, immoral, and inhumane. 
because people should never be uh, tested uh, with some kind of test like this that could uh, wind up ending up badly for a person. And as you can imagine, the end result of this testing was not good. Similar to that of the 13th century, when a man named King Frederick of Sicily tried something similar, he deprived newborns of language and touch, and the results was catastrophic. And every experiment ever done where, where people, babies, have been denied touch and language and proximity and nurturing and intimacy, in most of those, if not all of those cases, they always ended up bad, that the child was void of growth, maturation, or even life itself. Why? Because Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse number uh, 9 through 12, basically says that, listen, Two are better than one, for they have good return or reward for their labor. God meant for you and me to reach out and touch each other, to reach out and lift up each other, to reach out and encourage each other. If one of us falls, then we pick the other one up. None of us are an island. We need the connection in order to thrive and survive in life. Look at your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, I need you. Tell them back, you need me. Hezekiah Walker has a song saying, I need you to survive. He says, I prayed for you. You prayed for me. I love you. I need you to survive. I won't harm you. Y'all know this with words from my mouth. Are y'all with me? I love you. I need you to survive. Let the church say amen. Jesus sends out the 72 by two. We need each other. Secondly, you already peeped my point. We need God. Oh, every person in here, regardless of your age or stage, regardless as to how long you've been alive, regardless as to how much education you have or not, regardless as to how much money you have in your pocket or your bank account, we all need God. That was a shouting point right there. That was a hand clapping point right there. If you have lived, wait, let me ask you, has anyone lived long enough to recognize that I need God, that I need the every hour? Is anybody with me? I need God for every Every day of my life. I need God to hold it all together. I need God to keep my mind regulated. I need God to open up doors I can't open for myself. I need God to kick the devil out of situations where he doesn't belong. I need God to make me clean and holy. I need God to get out of the bed in the morning. I need God to walk upright. I need God to show me the way. I need God to get the devil off my track. I need God to turn something around. I need God to show me the way. If that's you, you say, I need God, then hand clap, make the devil mad. I need God. Robert Lowry and Annie Hawk sang, I need thee every hour, and every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. Do y'all know that song? Don't get cute this morning. Come on, say it with me. Say it. I need thee. Come on. Oh, I need thee. Every hour, what? I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my what? Savior, I come to thee. Marvin Sapp added something to it. He said, never would have made it. Y'all ain't here today. Never would have made it without you. He says, I would have lost it all. But now I see you were there for me. He says, I'm stronger. Are y'all with me? I'm wiser. I'm better. Oh, so much better. When I look back over all you brought me through, I can see it was you I held on to. If that's you today, somebody praise the Lord up in this place. Never would have made it. Let the church say amen. We need God. Go back to the first point. We need each other. Now let's go deeper. Most of us are familiar with the passage today because it contains the most biblical, one of the most popular biblical stories ever told. God the Father being the greatest author of the book, the Bible. Throughout the Bible, the Holy Spirit gives the detailed writings to four gospel uh, book writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Jesus, within these Bible verses, is telling us a familiar story today. The story is commonly known as the Good Samaritan. Now, the Good Samaritan is the story that's, uh, that's so vivid and so, so plain to us. You could almost miss the significance of this story, Jesus being the master.
It's the storyteller. He paints a picture. This actually didn't happen, but as you can imagine, it could and it would have happened in Jesus' day. Jesus drives the point home to tell them this parable. The foolishness and abasing of storytelling creates a life-changing opportunity for all who are hearing it. In verse number 30 of Luke chapter 10, Jesus says that this man, he went out from down uh, Jerusalem to Jericho. And when he did this, he fell among thieves. And when this happened to him, there were these people who passed by. But from this story, as we're talking about shifting and going to the next level and turning our direction around, we learn something about getting on the right track and moving into the will of God, if you will. There are three things quickly I want you to memorize or write them down. If you want to know when does God shift your position, how does God change my course, what does God do that ushers me over into where God is taking me, there's always at least three things that Jesus uses in this story that we we must understand. The very first one is so simple, you could almost miss it. The first one is God uses our humility. God takes the humility and the humbling of situations to bring us into a place of change. God uses whatever you humbly have to go through to get you to where you are going. Physically, this man in the story geographically went down, went down. This man left the mountains of Jerusalem some 2,600 feet above sea level to come down to Jericho some 800 feet below sea level. This man came from a high place and went down to a lower place. He had to walk through the wilderness to get there. Sometimes the major transition you're going through in life involves you coming down from what you might perceive as a high place and you being humbled. God is allowing someone right now to go through the humbling and humility of testing. Why? Because Proverbs 18 and 12 says before honor is humility, meaning God always brings down the prideful. God always elevates the humble. God always brings down the, the big know-it-alls and he elevates those who say, Lord, I just trust in you. God always brings down those who beat them their chest and say, I'm a self-made man or woman. And God always elevates those to say, Lord, I need thee, like we were singing a moment ago, every hour. God always brings down the narcissistic, the self-centered, and God always promotes those who can look out for the needs of others. Why? Because God is into us recognizing that it's always, always about him. It's not always about you. It's not always about me. It's about honoring God and glorifying him. If I can help someone along the way, then my living won't, y'all with me, be in vain. God wants us to get out of ourselves and so he allows us to go through testing and trials and to go to a place of humility to elevate you out of that humble humility experience. Someone in here is going through something difficult and it's abasing you and it's humbling you. It feels like it's crippling you. It feels like it's breaking you. But understand this, what God is doing is he's bringing you down so that he could lift you up. He's bringing you down through a, to a place of humility so that you could go to the next level because no big head joker no self-centered person is able to be used of God in that way. God always has to bring us to a place if we don't humble our own selves to a place of humility. That's why the Bible says, humble thyself under the mighty hand of God. Listen, why? That he may exalt you in due season. What else does God use when he's about to promote you? Not only does God use humility, but also God uses isolation. See, in Luke chapter 10, verse 30, if we go back and look at it, it says he fell among thieves. Now, what happened when this man in the story fell among thieves, he leaves the familiar surroundings and familiar people to all of a sudden people who are using him and mistreating him. Who am I talking to today? Sometimes we're in an unfamiliar place where people take advantage of us. And sometimes in an unfamiliar place where people, as you look around, they mean you no good. Sometimes in this unfamiliar place, this wilderness, of life, we run into some people like this man did, did as he's already humble in the base and has come down. Are y'all with me? Now they have the nerve to kick him while he's down. Don't raise your hand, but has anyone ever kicked you while you were down? Has anyone ever said something mean to you? Oh, something so jarring and so uh, destructive while you were already feeling bad about yourself. And you said, man, why are you beating me while I'm already down? Well, understand this today. Before we go any further, God can heal you 
everywhere you hurt. You don't have to carry that hurt any longer. You don't have to walk around with it another day. You don't have to look out both ways and, and see, is there anybody else in here looking to take me? No, I understand this. Whatever they did to you, God covered you, kept you, and delivered you through all of that. The, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers what? Out of them all. So when God gets ready to use us, when God gets ready to take you to the next level, he allows you to go through a place of humility. He, he brings you from Jerusalem down to Jericho through the wilderness. Not only does God do that, but secondly, God allows you to go through isolation where you start feeling like I'm the only person who can relate to my situation. But not only does God use isolation and humility, but God also uses our challenges. Now, if you notice quickly here in verse number 30, I underlined some things for you. These are the challenges this man faced. He was already traveling alone, innocently. This lonely man fell among thieves. He all of a sudden had people mistreating him. And if you look at the litany of things that happened to this man, it's horrific. And if you can just think about your own situation, we all got our own situation you could think about where you say, man, how could a person go so low and hurt you so badly? Have you ever said, God, how can a person stoop so low to come and get me? I must be by myself. <laughs> this man was left for dead. This man was stolen from and wounded and hurt and mis, uh, mis, uh, mis, uh, mis, uh, treated here so badly that, listen, this looked like it was the end, but I got to go back to what I said a moment ago. How many of you know, even though the weapon may form, it will not prosper? Oh, don't give the devil any credit this morning. I said the weapon may form, but it will not prosper. It did. Listen, I want you to think about your own situation quickly. Whatever you feel like was going to last a lot, the rest of your life. Life. Whatever you feel like it was you climbing up the rough side of the mountain like the song, whatever you felt like was going to always be this way. But I'm so glad trouble don't last. Help me always that God incubates us and covers us and keeps us and fortifies us and protects us. Oh, that God puts a hedge of protection around us. God, like in the days of Job, he says, devil, you can only do so much. But at the end, God gives you the victory. I wonder if I have any victorious people up in here today who say, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come, but God kept me. I'm still here. Make the devil mad this morning and put your hands together if you're still here. Wave if you say, I'm still here. Shout if you say, I'm still here. God kept me. I'm still in the land of the living. Still got my mind. Still got my God working on my behalf. Still got the Holy Spirit showing me up. Who am I talking to today? I'm trying to get out of here. Listen, can I get somebody who wants understands quickly that the Lord kept me. The Lord, he's been good to me. He's been better to me than I've been to myself. Enemies may have mistreated. People may have tried to knock me down, kick me down, stop me down, but I'm still here. And I got up with my right mind. I'm still here to say God kept me. Early I will seek you, God. It was you and you alone. When my enemies came upon me to eat my flesh, David said they stumbled and fell. If that's you up in here and you say, Lord, I thank you. I am more than a conqueror. Anybody more than a survivor? Anybody more than just, oh, I'm glad I'm lucky. I made it through the another. No. Listen, is there anybody here who say I've taken a licking, but I keep on ticking? The Lord kept me, and he's keeping me right now. If that's you, give the Lord a ridiculous standing ovation, a hand clap of praise. Give him 10 seconds of praise. Come on, I'm not going to leave you alone till you get with me. Can I get you to stand up and say, Lord, thank you for keeping me. If that's you, give him glory. Give him honor and praise. you got five more seconds. Praise the Lord in this place. Hallelujah. He kept me. Oh, I bless your holy name. Somebody at that shoe shot. Yes. Hey, hallelujah. You may be seated. Through humility, through isolation, through challenges, God ushers you into change. Now watch this. Let me go back to teaching. But the problem, let's uh, what? hold you too long. If you look at verse 31, it says there was a priest who didn't help this man. Verse 32, there was a Levite who didn't help this man. Verse 33, there was a Samaritan who did. The religious leaders didn't help. And the shift that we're talking about today, S-H-I-F-T, the shift that we're talking about today is that God will do something in you mentally first, oftentimes. So mind-blowing, like this story. 
Because all of us in here, if we had to bet on someone who would help the man who was hurt, we probably wouldn't pick a Samaritan. You know what a Samaritan was? Samaritans were referred to by the Jews as dogs. Samaritans were a half-breed people. Samaritans were not high on the food chain. They were not well respected. In fact, a Jew thought themselves to be way better than a Samaritan. So if you are a Jew listening to the story, you're going to say, well, either the Levite pastor or the priest is going to help this man who's hurt. It won't be the Samaritan. And with all of that kind of discriminatory thinking, Jesus says, I'm going to blow your mind. Because I'm going to use something, I'm going to do something that you're not expecting me to do for God to do so that you can see that's the kind of God he is. And to shift something in you mentally first, some of us are stuck in neutral and can't go to the next level because your thinking is too small. Your thinking is too limited. You have already, like a chessboard, figuring out what has to happen first. And God is saying, erase all of that. I don't need to do it the way you figured it out. I'm God. You don't tell me what to do. In fact, I'm God. I'll do it the way I want to do it. So when we decide, God, you must do it like this and like this and like this and like this, God said, ah, we're going to do this a whole different kind of way. There is a God we serve who says, you may think it takes the matriculation of a university moving on to your masters in order for me to open up a door for you. But God says every now and then, I'll let somebody who never ever went to school make two times what you make just to show you I'm God. You may think it's going to take years and years and years and years and years. And what you think will take years and years and years. God says, I'm going to do it just like that in a couple of seconds just to show you I am God. What has God messed you up with? Have you ever had to pull your car over on the side of the road and just sit there and say, Lord, I don't understand it, but I thank you today. You did that, God. Because as long as you can figure it out, then it what listen, what would you need God for? So God says, I gotta do some things sometimes that don't add up together. In fact, with God, one plus one or two times two or two plus two is not four. God is not into adding, he's into multiplication. So what God does is he lets something happen mentally for you first, but then he also does something in you spiritually. So the deliverance and the ride to the next level doesn't just happen in your mind. He's got to get it from your mind into your spirit. See, the priest and the Levite and the Samaritan, they were all on their way somewhere. They weren't just stopping to look for a person on the side of the road. They were going somewhere. And in verse number 31, you saw that the priest was going somewhere. Verse 32, you know that the Levite was going somewhere. Verse 33, the Samaritan, he was going somewhere too. But the Samaritan was not just getting by in life. He was going somewhere also. And the journey onto where he was going, he stopped because, listen, we have to understand this, that on the journey to where you are going to the next level, God has some stops for us sometimes to make. And if you should maximize the moment for all that it is worth and not miss the moment, then it will be the thing to springboard you into where God is taking you. All it takes is something simple as for you to recognize that what you think is beneath you is actually the thing God wants you to step on to get to the next level. Y'all ain't here today. Because as long as you think I'm too big for this, you will miss the small moment that takes you into something big. As long as you think I'm too good for this, to do this badly for a moment, you will miss the best thing that God has for you. So sometimes he'll have you to stop for a moment. And when you stop for a moment, the preparation to get to the next level, the preparation for the door to open, watch this, the preparation for you to go to where God is taking you next involves you helping someone else. Well, this is a good word today. The spiritual preparation for where God is taking you involves the word compassion. Because as long as you think that the journey to where God is taking you is only about you, then you will miss that part of the way God may have you help carry somebody, pick somebody else up, put salve on their wounds, because it's all part of the process for where God is taking you. Who are you helping other than yourself? And now all of us want a promotion, don't we? But not most of us in here at the end of the day. 
think beyond helping ourselves. I mean, we'll help you to an extent, but to the extent where I get tired. Because when I get tired, you don't want me to be tired in helping you. I mean, I might drop your furniture, get somebody else to help you move. Because at this point, <laughs> you said you said two hours. This is four. You said two. See how we think. You said two hours. Okay. <laughs> you, in fact, you said five o'clock. I've been sitting here for thirty minutes idly. So we're gonna subtract that from what time I'm leaving. No, so y'all ain't telling the truth. Listen, listen, we will help you to a certain extent. And sometimes tell the truth. People helping you, there's another motive involved. I'll never forget, Rachel, we had somebody that was put out of the apartment uh, uh, below our apartment. He got put out. And there was a neighbor who called himself helping him. He said, I'm going to sit here and watch your stuff while you go make some phone calls. And the man went shopping on the stuff that was put out. In fact, when I drove and went to the store, I came back. He was trying out the man's exercise equipment on Palmer Road. Are y'all with me up in here? <laughs> y'all ain't hear that. Because we look out for our own self oftentimes and our own personal peace and affluency and our own abilities and our own might and what we can accumulate and what's happening for us. Oftentimes, we miss the fact that the springboard to God taking us to the next level is to actually see the needs of others. Look at verse 33 again, it's still on the screen. The Samaritan, he journeyed and where he was, he came to this man and he had what? Compassion on him. This man had compassion, meaning he went beyond himself to see the needs of someone else. Today, I want to talk with you about the next level and the next step to you going to the next level is for you to see the needs of others and have compassion. Do you know how difficult that is? I'm not describing something to you that's easy because it goes a little something like this. You have the greatest need, but all of a sudden someone shows up matching your need and you have to stop thinking about your need for a moment to help somebody else. I'll never forget I was in college and uh, had an apartment. This guy, he said, man, uh, come over. You know, I was sick. I said, well, don't get too close. He said, I'm going to come over. I, I got to drop something by. He came, said, I'm going to come over. He came by, and I thought he was going to bring some orange juice and some chicken noodle soup and some salt and crackers and some Vicks Vapor Rub. Y'all know about that. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And some cough medicine and some Tylenol. But he came in empty-handed. And when he came in empty-handed, I said, you at least got a, a, a lozenger on you. Nothing, man. I'm like, well, what do you want? He's like, well, I'm going through something. And he proceeded to tell me a story to which I sat up in the bed almost said, get out, tell y'all with me. <laughs> my mind said it, <laughs> but it never came out of my mouth. When he was finished, I was like, mm -hmm. I'm praying for you, brother. Hang in there. Have you ever had to help people when you needed help yourself? Oh, y'all really kind of quiet this morning because this is on your street because no one, no one, no one likes to stop when we are in distress and see the distressful need of others. Do you understand the Samaritan on the street late at night? I don't know what time of day it was. Jesus didn't say, but do you understand helping this man? Do you know that while he went to stop the help, he should have been looking around to see if anybody was going to point him out. Samaritan, get out of here. You half Jew, half whatever. But instead, he's like, I got to forget about what's going on with me to help somebody else and in order for you to help someone else you have to forget about what's going on with you today i want to talk with you about what's stopping some of you from from prospering and going to the next level what's stopping you from going to the next level in relationships and finances and promotions and whatever god has for you next it is called compassion luke 16 and 12 if you have not been faithful in that which is of another man's, who, who shall give you that which is your own? Luke 16, 12 says, be faithful in that which pertains to another man or person before you can think that God will bless you with your own. God is always saying, take care of the needs of others. Peter, feed my sheep. And to feed the poor, to clothe the needy, to mentor the fatherless, to counsel others, to counsel others, to provide uh, words of wisdom and to help someone else out, to just show up and to be there with them means that you move from being stuck on yourself to now recognizing there are people who need help. 
And this whole idea of being stuck no more on yourself is what God wants us to quickly get it. Why don't we help each other? Look at these verses again. In verse 31, do I have it? In verse 31, again, this man, he stops by. He sees what's happening. He's a priest. He's like, I ain't get my religious hands dirty. The next man, this Levi, who's also somewhere very religious, not of clergy, but of a devout uh, a sect of people of Jesus' day, of that time. He passes on the other. He's like, look, I ain't even getting near this man. I'm going to go over here on the other side. And the priests and the Levite who had positions in society, they avoid coming in contact with helping this man but helping this man would have helped them. And they listen, God allows us often time to experience the inconvenience of someone else's situation. It's never scheduled that someone else has a problem at the same time you do. But God already takes it into consideration that we may develop a helping behavior. And a helping behavior means that I start thinking about myself and what's going on with me and what I need. And I think about someone else, pro-social behavior, voluntarily actions that intend to help benefit someone else other than ourselves. But there's another level called altruism. And what altruism is distinguished from helping behavior because altruism refers to pro-social behavior that's carried out without the expectation of obtaining any external reward. It's when I say, I'm just going to help you and I don't even care if you give me something back or not. How altruistic, excuse me, are you? On the, on the fruit, one of the fruits of the spirit in Galatians 5 is called goodness. And goodness defines the character of God as loving, helping, supporting, and giving. How good are you to other people? Are you provoked by the Holy Spirit to be a blessing to someone else? Are you only seek to receive a blessing? Because when we only seek to receive a blessing rather than be a blessing, we miss the thing that takes us to the next level. Let me say it a different way. God can't use stingy people. Hell, kind of quiet. The world calls it like this. They call it paying it forward. Even the world in their philanthropic ways have a thinking about this. Oh, understand this today. Paying it forward is like this. Somebody shoveling your driveway. And because they shovel your driveway, then you help somebody else out. And it keeps going and going and going. What we have is today is a perpetuation of selfishness. Well, nobody helped me, so I'm not helping you. And then you don't want to help anybody. And it goes on and on and on and on and on and on. I'll never forget when I was in college. Ma. There was a man who was one of the few minorities, African-American males, who was working at the school at that time as a head of the department. I went to him. He had played in the NFL, and I was, uh, I was doing janitorial work, and I was, uh, uh, you know, cleaning the bathrooms in the, the, the hall, what's called Michelle DeMoss Hall, and I remember I went to him, and I said, look, as a freshman, I said, listen, you're a head of a department. Is there anything, is there any job? I was like, I'll clean this up office if you want me to. I'll do paperwork. I can type pretty fast. What do you need? And he looked at me and he said this, Ma. He said, he said, hmm, you tired of cleaning the toilets? I said, well, I'm not tired of it, but, you know, I'm just, you, you know, you, you are here. You're one of the few African-American males. I know you can help me. And he said, nobody helped me. Are y'all with me up in here? At that point, I looked and I was like, what does that have to do with me? And he, he had an attitude about it. He repeated, he said, nobody helped me. I had to do this and do that and do this. You think I made it to the, to the jets all by my, you think, you think somebody, you know, you think somebody uh, helped me rather. He said, you know, you think somebody. And I was looking at him, I was like, brother, so listen, you are in a position now, even though nobody helped you, you thinking that's not true, that, that now you can help somebody else. And if you help me, I'll help somebody else and we'll keep this thing going. But you shutting it down. He's like, I, I, I ain't going to help you. And I left discouraged for a moment. And I was like, God, this man was in the position to help me and he couldn't. And you know what God told me as I was walking back to my dorm? God told me he can't help you. I was like, but God, he can help me. And God was like, no, no, he can't help you. 
I was like, well, why can't he help me? He's like, because if you hook up with him, you'll develop that same spirit and mindset that he has. He's not the one. Look up again. I'm going to send somebody else. And he did. And somebody else opened up another door. Somebody else said, let me be blessed and helping you. Do you understand the words coming out of my mouth? God wants you to open yourself up to be able to be a blessing to someone else. Tap your neighbor who's quiet, bored or asleep or checking their phone. Tap them to tell them, pay it forward. Pay it forward. You know, I, I heard about this story, uh, this YouTuber. Do I have it? Yeah, it's called Reciprocity. Sometimes my notes get out of, out of jumble here. But I heard about this man. There it is. I don't know what's going on with the click. You're skipping. But listen, I heard about this man. He, he went up to a homeless man. Let, listen to this quickly. He's, and he gave the homeless man $100. And he followed the homeless man. You, you've heard this kind of story before, right? To see what the man was going to do with the money. And he followed the man and the man, the man took the money and went to the store and he came out of the store and he bought some things for all the homeless buddies he had handed out the food. So the man comes uh, who gave him the money. He comes back. He said, you know, I've been following you the whole time. And I got emotional when I saw you go in the store and come out and you divided up all the money with food between all these homeless people out here. He, he was like, you really couldn't afford to do that. Why didn't you keep it for yourself? And he said, well, that's that's the right thing to do to the YouTuber who's crying now. Reach is in his pocket. He says, you know, I'm going to give you another couple more hundred since you know what to do with it. I wonder how much is God waiting for us to say, you know, I could release something for you. I could pour down rain from heaven for you. I could open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing rather. I could give you the incredible blessing, the thing you've been waiting for, but I'm waiting to see what you're going to do with it. Why? Because listen, God doesn't just hand out things to people who aren't ready for it. A lot of times we say, I'm praying for it, pastor, because the thing God is working on, it must not be ready for me yet. Flip the thing, recognize also you might not be ready for it yet because the Lord knows what you have need of even before you ask, but he's going to give it to you when you are ready. And some of us are saying, I'm ready, God. And God is saying, you're not ready. You're not ready because you're still too stingy. You're not ready because you're still thinking about yourself. You're not ready because you still think everything evolves around you. But when you get to this place where you say, you know what? Let me do what the Lord had me to do while it is yet day. Jesus said, for the night coming when no man can work. Let me honor God. Let me bless somebody. Let me help someone along the way. And then we move from being a Christian who just wants everything to saying, Lord, make me a distributor. Make me like Joseph. Let, make me somebody who's a conduit there to hand out blessings. That when you come to me, I'm not warehousing things. Some of you can't afford to be stingy. Because right now you need the biggest miracle of your life. I'm closing quickly. Is there anybody here today who would say, that's me? I need God to move in my life. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, some of you, you, you got the big prayer request. You've got some incredible thing you need God to do. Listen, hold on, not, not yet, Sean, but listen, you're at a place where you say, God, I need you to do such an incredible thing. I don't have time to be stingy. I don't have time to be self-centered. I don't have time to just look out for myself. I need God to move such an incredible way that let me, let me, if that's all it is, God, let me change my thinking like this good Samaritan and switch from being an individual Christian to being a comprehensive Christian, Christian to being a Christian who sees the needs of others. Why? Because it will unlock some door for you that may seem like, I wonder if the thing that's keeping you from moving into the next level is just that simple that when you put bandages on the wounds of others then expect God takes care of your wounds you know one of the hardest things to do you know James, Michelle, Ma Rachel is to be dealing with grief and to to come in contact with someone who has grief. Now watch this, Sister Debbie, and not tell them about your grief. Because leading with your grief might shut down them opening up about theirs. And have to listen through all of that and say, God, at what point do I get to share my grief with this person as I'm listening and 10 minutes pass and 20 minutes pass and 30 minutes pass. And what God told me along the way, the first time it happened, because it's happened more than once, <laughs> way more than once, the first time it happened, God showed me that I have allowed you to go through what you've gone through and for me to pour into you what you need for yourself so that when I send you someone, you will be available to them. Because don't nobody want to hear you just saying, hang in there. 
Hang in there, Deacon Nate. Don't nobody want to hear. That's all you got. Hang in there. No, God says, I'm going to allow you to go through hell so that when I minister into you an anointing and something to hold you through your own situation, you'll be able to say more than just hang in there. God says, the same comfort you receive, help me say Corinthians, of me, I'll be able to help you turn it around and minister it to somebody else. Doesn't that change how you look at your situation then? Because now I'm looking at my situation like, oh, this is not even about me. Somebody don't like you, just get excited. Ooh, this is not even about me. <laughs> Somebody can't stand you. They set up traps for you. Oh, this is not even about me. <laughs> All this thing's coming your way, Deacon Lee. This is not even about me. What God is doing is setting me up so that when I get through this one, I'll be able to turn around and help somebody else with what they're going through. I'll be looking, y'all. I'll be looking. I'm closing. I'll be looking. I'll be going, okay, God, who, who, why am I going through this? Why, the boy, brother, dad, why am I going through this? Why, why, why? It's got to be somebody. And sure enough, a week may pass. A couple weeks may pass. A month, I'll even take a year. I've learned how to be patient up until a year. But when it finally hits, I'm going, oh, you're the one. Let me tell you, I've been looking for you. Look at today, I've been looking for you. Look at somebody and tell them I've been looking for you. I've been wondering where you were. You were hiding, you were asleep. You were going through it, girl. You were going through a difficult situation, man. But now you finally come out the cut and reveal who you are. I've been wondering who this was for. Now let me tell you what God has put within me in this situation. Because I was about to lose my mind and hurt somebody. But now that you done showed up, I know exactly what to tell you. Hang in there. Trust God. You don't need all that. It's good. This too shall I'll pass. You might not need all them lawyers. I'll come on out there. Listen, you're going to get through this. Don't hurt nobody. You're not going to lose your mind up in here, up in here. You're going to get through this, and you're going to come out better than you were before. That's when you say, God, it's not about me. It's not about me. Can I talk to some doubters, some watchers, and some shouters? Some waiters, some delayed folks, some praying up folk, some stayed folks, and some hated folks, detained and contained folks to tell you your transition is about to happen. Be still and know that he is God. Look beyond your own needs, Samaritan, and see the needs of others. Understand that God has us in this connectivity called the human race. And the sooner I switch from looking in the mirror to looking out the window, I'll use a telescope if you have to. I'm looking to see who is the person God has sent my way that I may help you with, with all I've been through because it is not about me. If you got the word today, so yes. You understand this as we close. The question is, are you ready? Are you ready for God to open up doors for you? Are you ready for God to take you to the next level? Are you ready for God to turn some things around in your favor? Look at your neighbor, tell them you're going to another level. You're going to another level. I know it seems difficult right now, but you're going to another level. I know something's getting on your nerves, but you're going to another level. No, you can't stand this right now, but you are going to another level. Don't quit before the thing ends. This too shall pass. Oh, help me, First Peter chapter 5, verse 10. But the God of all grace, after you have suffered a while. He'll make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. God says, I'm putting something in you through this situation. Why? Because it's not just to get you through the situation, but it's so that when somebody comes hurt, broke, busted, and disgusted, wounded, and limping, you'll say, oh, I thank God now that I went through that. Let me tell you what you need to do. Let me help you through your situation. Let me lift you up, traveler, so you can get back on the road. God is changing you from being a patient to being a physician. God is changing you while all you know it is breaking loose, while you've been tempted like never before, while you're going through the biggest challenge of your mind. Because the breakdown is setting you up for a breakthrough. The setback is so that, listen, you can be you can be moved into the setup God has for you. This trial means triumph. This knockdown means he's lifting you up. Ready or not, here it comes. Are you ready? I want you to think of some things that's frustrating and getting on your nerves and recognize it's just God preparing you for the next level. Tell your neighbor quickly, get ready. <laughs> get ready means to fast and pray. Get ready means to clean up your mind. Get ready means to get rid of some old things 
think. And get ready means to look outside of yourself. Get ready means to God is preparing you to go higher and higher in him. The troubles that you're going through, they don't come to last, they come to pass. And what God is doing is preparing you for promotion. And the next time you say, this thing feels so heavy upon me, see it as God saying, I'm taking you to another level. I'm taking you to another level. Now, quickly, let me close with this. A lot of times we think that God is bringing us down a notch to another low level. And we say, God, how much lower can I go? God, I can't limbo this thing. God, I can't go any lower or be more humble than I already am. And sometimes God is allowing you to go through, through some things that ground you so that you might become grounded in the word and grab hold of the word and the Holy Ghost. But understand this. When I say God is taking you to another level through your trials and tribulations, he's not just allowing you to go down through your trials and tribulations. See, all of those as promotion. See, there's an old gospel song that tells a story about a mule and the farmer didn't like the mule. So he threw the mule down in the, down in the well are y'all with me? And when he threw the mill down the well, he decided to bury the mill. So he threw some dirt on the mill. But when he threw the dirt on the mill the first time, he shook it off. Y'all know the story. And he threw some more dirt on the mill again, and the mill shook it off. He kept throwing dirt in the hole, throwing it on the mill, and the mill kept shaking off the dirt. He looked up in the, the mill, who had been shaking off the dirt and stepping on it, was all of a sudden up there with him once again back on the ground. Why? Because he was shaking it off. I wonder if you could just shake off what's happening to you. Shake it off because God is using it for you to, you to shake it off and step on it so it's under your feet because the thing you keep shaking off and stepping on is actually Minister Sandy bringing you into promotion. I wonder who needs to shake something off today. Shake, shake, shake. Shake the devil off. Shake them off when you say I'm upset. Shake them off when you say I'm frustrated. I'm lonely. I'm bored. I'm tired. Listen, shake it off in Jesus' name and step on it. Recognize it's under your feet. I said shake the devil off and step on it. Why? Because God is using it to promote you, to raise you up to the next level. Does anybody understand you got places to go and people to see? You don't have time to wallow. I'm in a hole. This farmer done threw me down on the hole. What am I going to do? Shake it off in the name of Jesus. I wonder if you need to shake off something from the last five months. Shake off something from the last five years. Maybe from when you were five. Whatever it is, you got to shake it off in the name of Jesus. Tap your neighbor quickly and tell him, shake it off. I don't know what it is, but you got to shake it off. Somebody say, shake, shake, shake. Shake the devil off. Shake the devil off your mind. Shake the devil off your thinking. Shake the devil off your emotions. Shake him off in the name of Jesus and rise up to the next level. For all of you who are going through something, it's the thing God's going to use to take you over to the next level. He's going to promote you out of this through this. Why? Because it's not even about you. And the sooner we recognize it's not about us, you'll take that anointing God's put within you through your trials and tribulations, turn and help someone else through theirs. I wonder if you recognize Recognize today, God is calling you into surgery to be a surgeon. God is calling you into med school to be a doctor. God wants you to switch from being a patient to being a doctor today. If that's you, I want you to give God 10 seconds of praise. I bless you, God, because now I know why I've been going through. As you stand to your feet, now you know why you've been going through. Now you know why you've been suffering. Now you know why. This has been getting on your nerves. Now you know why you can't stand it. Because it's not about you. It's always been bigger, Samaritan. It's always been some bigger test. And out of your testimony, or test rather, comes a testimony. We said this last week, out of your misery comes your ministry. You can't help people like you really can help them until you go through this thing. So therefore, God, take me through. Lord, if I'm going to come out a better man or better woman, take me through. God, if I'm going to come out with my, my mind, God, renewed and, and a closer walk with you, take me through. If I'm going to come out better. You know, the children of Israel were sought after by Pharaoh when they left Egypt, not just because he wanted to make them slaves again, <laughs> but because when they left Egypt, they took all the gold <laughs> and the silver. <laughs> they took everything out of Pharaoh's house. So when he was chasing them, he was like, I want my stuff back. Wait a minute, I said, y'all can go. Because I'm sick of these frogs and this lice and all these plagues and killing of the unborn, the, the firstborn. He was like, listen, I'm chasing you now. <laughs> You're chasing after you, Joy. I'm chasing you now because I want my stuff back. He's like, I'm chasing after you. Give me all of my gold back. <laughs> I need it more and more. 
You understand today. <laughs> you understand today. I forgot what my point was. <laughs> the enemy. He's hot after you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. He's hot after you because of what you are receiving through this trial and tribulation. We were we read First Peter chapter five verse ten because God has made you perfect, established, strengthened, and settled you. God is making you better through this, but it's a choice. You can be better through this situation, or you could become bitter. You can become stronger, or you can let this thing that make you become weak. You could become more God centered and people centered, or you could become more self centered. And the moment you become more self centered, you miss an opportunity to springboard yourself into the next level. Who is it that's going through something today that you need to stop looking at your own needs and self for a moment and help someone else? Father God, in the name of Jesus, help us to be altruistic. Help us to have compassion. Help us to be God-focused. Help us to see the needs of others. Help us to see beyond our own wants and frustrations. Help us to see beyond our own disappointments. Help us to see God what we need and see the needs of others. We trust in you. We look unto you. Lord, we put in your hands what we have need of. We're not minimizing, God, our own situation. Some of us have situations of frustration today, and an unmet expectation equals a frustration. Because of these frustrations, God, some of us are so stopped and stuck, but we're also blinded. We can't see the needs of others. So God, we get out of ourself. We cancel our complaining today and we press into you. And Lord, we lift up to you right now, those who are grieving, those who are going through frustration, pain, and difficulty, those who have their own internal turmoil. God, we pray for those who are without food, without clothing. God, we pray for those who need jobs and restoration, for those who need salvation, for those who are caught up in addictions and need deliverance and healing, for those who have physical calamities and peril, God, for those who are dealing with destruction, those who've been abused, Lord God, and misuse, we pray for the needs of others. We pray for those who have had failed relationship situations, those who are in a marriage, Lord God, and they feel like they're the only one in the marriage, God, and they, they are frustrated, God, and they're looking for the exit. We pray for the one who has been failing in school and barely getting by and here's a new school year and they're feeling the intrepidation and intimidation of having to go back to school or maybe repeat a grade we pray for those who are in a dead-end job and they were looking for a career but they're just working they're just working and they're sick and tired of just being a worker they want a career we pray for those god who are in uh, platonic relationships lord god they're surface level they're not going to a level of intimacy and closeness and they're sick of playing like they really are interested in in the situation or the person, God. They, they want something real and they want someone who really cares about them. We pray for those, Lord God, who are experiencing right now the pain, the, the loss, Lord God, of, of losing someone or something, that separation from something that feels like it was taken from them too soon or prematurely or stolen from them. Lord God, we pray, Lord, that you restore back unto them the years that the locusts and palmer worm and canker worm have eaten up and stolen from them. We pray for those, Lord God, who are going through great heavy today. The pain and the angst and the anxiety. They can't eat anything. They can't sleep at night. They don't want to do anything. They've lost their, their desire.
this way. God, let them come down the aisle right now before we close out this prayer. Oh, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to open the precious gift of salvation, make it available, that is, and open the doors of the church. Let no one leave, Lord God, unchanged today. Let no one leave without making a decision for you. This is our prayer. We thank you in the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hand clap for the word of God today. Thank him for his word. Amen. Amen. Look at your neighbor on your way down and tell your neighbor you're going to the next level. Tell your neighbor quickly you're going to the next level. You are going to the next level. Amen. Give God praise. Amen. You're going to the next level. Give God praise. Come on. We are going to the next level. We're going to the next level. Amen. Amen. As we prepare our hearts and our minds for uh, our giving now, for our offering. It's uh, Minister Sandy, you come and pray for us, please. Let's prepare our hearts and our mind and say, God, show us exactly how to give. Lord, give us instruction on giving today. It's unto you. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord God. An opportunity to give, Father, to your glory. Lord, let us be mindful of the fact that everything that we have, Lord God, we owe it all to you. So, God, we just thank you right now for the hearts that you will move on, Lord, and for that which you have given us, Lord, that we would continue to bring glory to your name in the earth. We thank you now, Lord, and we believe, Lord God, that we are moved by your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for obedient hearts. Thank you, Lord, for something to give. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life for us. We love you, honor you, and praise you in Jesus' name we pray. Thank you.